So good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Welcome to this, the second in a new IEA series of In Conversation events, where I sit down and have a conversation virtually at the moment, not face to face, sadly, with a politician, a thought leader, a journalist or a newsmaker to discuss their philosophy their views, what they think of the world today, what they think of the state of human freedom today. And before I introduce our superb guest for this evening, one of the titans and giants of the free market movement, let me get the boring housekeeping points uh, uh, out of the way. So we're, we're streaming this on YouTube and on Zoom. I've got my eyes really on the Zoom side of the conversation. So if you're joining us on Zoom, uh, and you would like to put a question to our guest this evening, please use the Q&A function, not the chat box, the Q&A function. Use the chat box for everything else that you want to talk about, but for questions, put it in the Q&A bit. Uh, you do the Q, and I'll make sure that we get a very good A from our guest speaker this evening. <laughs> uh, if you haven't asked a question, but you've got a view about the questions that are in there, then uh, this is a pretty democratic process. You can give a thumbs up to the questions you like. Uh, so if there's a question that catches your eye and you give it a thumbs up, that will move it up the league table. And being a democratic kind of guy, I'll probably incline to take the questions towards the, towards the top of the list. Uh, and put your questions in whenever you want. You don't have to wait till the end. I, I've got a few questions I'm gonna give, uh, I'm gonna start off with before we come to questions from the speakers. I'll try and keep half an eye on YouTube. I know our tech people have said uh, you won't be able to ask questions there. I'll do my very best to, to multitask and take questions from YouTube if I'm able, but I'll have most of my eye on the Zoom Q&A. Um, so that's where you should put your cues. So to, for tonight's event, uh, great honor, great privilege, delighted to be joined by one of the world's greatest freedom <laughs> fighters. Uh, Linda Wetston is the chairman of the Network for a Free Society, president of the Mont Pelerin Society, until two weeks ago, was also chairman of the Atlas Network of free market pro-freedom think tanks. If that wasn't enough, she is also a board member of the Institute of Economic Affairs and of the Istanbul Network for Liberty. And Linda's talents and hobbies also extend far beyond the Liberty Network and the cause for freedom. Since 2019, she has been the chairman of British Dressage as well. Uh, through the Network for a Free Society, Linda supports the translation of texts from the IEA and other free market think tanks into a whole range of different languages, uh, supports their publication, distribution and promotion to people right across the world in the form of books, mini libraries on discs, uh, with a particular emphasis on providing access to the ideas of liberty in many middle and lower income countries, where previously there was virtually no access to these ideas at all. To give you an idea of the scale of that, in 2019 alone, the Network for a Free Society funded the translation and printing of about 15,000 copies of seven different classical liberal texts into 14 different languages across more than 20 countries, as well as printing, producing almost 11,000 CDs, some with over 100 texts on them, and they've been distributed in 28 countries right across Africa and Asia. Linda is, of course, the daughter of our founder, Sir Anthony Fisher, the co-founder of the IEA, has always been close to the IEA, and we're really honoured and delighted to have you with us this evening. Good evening, Linda. Lovely to have you with us. Um, I want to kick off with the IEA, then we might go a bit more global and international, Linda. So let's go back to the, the foundation of the Institute of Economic Affairs. You were uh, a, a young girl when the IEA was created, and I, I know you've recalled before how you watched the concept of the IEA develop in your father's mind. And uh, I think you were there when its doors opened in a very humble basement in Hobart Place, uh, before we then moved on to Eaton Place and now at Two Lord North Street with our far from humble, brilliant TV and radio studio that we've now constructed here. Tell us about those early days of the IEA. What was going through your father's mind? Why would anybody have been mad enough to create us in the first place? Well, good evening, Mark. It's lovely to be with the IEA, even if only virtually. And if I'm 
more a little old lady than a titan, but I'm still as excited about what the IA does as I was when I was 14. My father was transfixed all of the time I knew him by the possibility of Europe, indeed the world, being overrun by communism, that the sacrifices made by so many in two world wars, including his own father and brother, would have been for nothing. Well before Friedrich Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom, which my father read on the front of the um, Reader's Digest, um, he fervently believed, my father fervently believed, that freedom was the solution to poverty and repression, and that the concept of a free society must be um, supported, promoted and defended. Originally, he thought he'd go and do this by being a politician, but when he sought Hayek out at the London School of Economics and he told him he was going to solve all Hayek's problems by being a, becoming a politician, the look on Hayek's face didn't, wasn't entirely encouraging. And he explained to my dad that when you become a politician, you have to compromise on principles. And if you have very strong principles, it's not the best way to go. So Hayek persuaded him that he should go away and make some money, and then he should start an institute which would um, uh, take academic research into market solutions for social and economic problems and um, make it accessible to lay people. So lay people could begin to understand these arguments and that as, uh, as he influenced their opinion, then he would be able to influence policy. For a 14 year old like me, that was really heady times when all these things dad had talked about came to fruition. And there I was in the basement of Lord North Street making tea for Arthur Selden, who was the editor and I thought was nearly God. But despite this wonderful beginning, it was 20, 20, more than 20 long years before really anything happened that would give you hope that the IEA was going to have a big influence on the world. So um, there wasn't much sign of success in the early days. And it, it, it was a very unusual concept. Then I want to come into what think, think tanks are for for a minute. But I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if history records. Perhaps you can recall what your father's reaction was to Hayek sort of saying, don't go into elected politics, spread these ideas by another means. But think tanks weren't really a thing back then. Right. Most people know what they are now. It was a, it was a very new concept of trying to do something about ideas and policy and philosophy. Is that right? Um, I would have thought dad was like Eeyore with a broken balloon when Hayek told him that his idea wasn't any good. And I don't think, I mean, the Fabians had done something similar. Mm -hmm. And I think dad had always, you know, there'd been a thought there that if one could do the Fabians in reverse, if people could really understand how freedom, um, how freedom was the solution, um, um, to, to, to so many problems, whereas government wasn't. And I mean, a think tank to me now, um, a university is to do with, with educational research. So we're led to believe. The think tanks really ed education, research, education, and promotion of ideas through a certain lens. Um, and then you've got campaigning organizations which probably give up on the research and the education bit and just go campaigning. So we're somewhere in the middle there and, and we hope to influence people through research as to the merits of a free society. Um, so, so, so the real idea, and is it right that your father was, I mean, you said he's, he's sort of all of his instincts were in favor of a free society and he feared the rise of communism and, and, and socialism. Uh, but, but was it reading uh, Hayek's Road to Serfdom that really kind of inspired him into action? That, that's what made him think he should do something with it. I mean, ultimately devote his life to this particular cause rather than simply hold these opinions and talk about them amongst friends and family. Oh, no, he wasn't doing that anyway. He was already roaring around trying to influence things. He was on the council and he was so incensed when they told Woolworths it couldn't paint its door red. I can remember him coming home and saying, how could anybody be so stupid as to dictate what Woolworths door should be painted? Um, and there were other things going on and he joined all sorts of people who were campaigning for different aspects of freedom. Um, um, and he was, he, was a, he was sort of tormented by it. He needed to find a solution to this thing. Um, and then um, when he read The Road to Serfdom, he saw, he saw that Hayek understood something enormously deep 
that he hadn't, he was an engineer, that he, he'd never read any of these books that he hadn't seen before. And that was what absolutely inspired him. Um, um, I mean, he, he believed um, that was when he really got, he got into the sort of the battle. It wasn't really a battle. It was a, well, the, dis the big discussion on the ideas between things being run by government and by free people, really. So, uh, I mean, th this sounds like a ridiculous question coming from me because you're on the board that have employed me to <laughs> run a think tank for more than a decade. But I, I want to get into sort of what is a think tank? Because the, the word is now bandied around an awful lot. I mean, you're, you'll even hear it referred to in sort of Hollywood movies occasionally, a, a much more kind of revolutionary concept going back to the 1950s when the IEA was formed. But what is it? Why a think tank? Why not just become a professor at a university or write a book and try and get it printed and sell it in a bookstore? What's a think tank supposed to do that other institutions like universities or individual authors apparently can't do on, the, on, on their own? Uh, if you work in a think tank, you're sort of, you, you have a mission. Um, you look at everything through a lens, in this instance, through the lens of freedom. In universities, you're researching all sorts of things, and, and one thinks that um, quite a lot of influencing goes on there as well. Um, but, but I think the, the research, well, we like to think that, that what we promote and believe in is based on research. And we do, after all, um, and there's a load of books behind me. There's probably a load of books behind you. I can see my dad sitting on the shelf behind you. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> my shoulder here, yeah. Watching me, dad. Um, and, and, and that this gives a legitimacy. Um, I don't know. There's, I think most people who work in think tanks, there's a passion about what they do. They, they want to change things, hopefully for the better. At least I assume everyone wants to do it for the better, whether or not they do. Um, and I think that's why we're involved in the think tank. We believe that um th that that free people um are best able to achieve human flourishing um that that human flourishing is best served when individuals are free and those in power are controlled um, within certain structures such as the rule of law protection of private property free markets and free speech um we're, we're, we're not anarchists at all we believe in limited government and individual freedom, um, and that that's uh, where the best outcomes come from for, for humans, and that it's that applies to all humans, um, and that that countries where ha which have the, the 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 best rule of law, protect private property and free markets, are where all humans do better. And if you look at the poorer countries in the world, that seems to be the weakness. Not the only weakness. There's all sorts of other things, but I do believe passionately that that you know Hong Kong. Um, developed a fantastic economy and a wonderful life on a rock. Um, uh, unfortunately, that may be going to go. Uh, and I mean, the average income is there, I think, 48,000. In Tanzania, where they have a wonderful country and a wonderful port, incomes are $1,000 a, mm -hmm. a year compared to 48. And if you look at the sort of basic structures and the, the amount of trade, you have to be able to exchange. Free societies are winners because they promote exchange. Um, and everywhere you look, where there's more exchange, um, better rule of law, you get less poverty and more flourishing. And better results. And so going back to those early days, you were recollecting, you know, making a cup of tea for Arthur Seldon, our, the <laughs> IA's first director of research. But you also sort of referred to, it might have felt, however exciting it was, a little bit like pushing water uphill, right, to try and get traction for these ideas, which didn't have much currency at the time, okay, it was quite a minority view to support free markets and free exchange. Um, did you feel, did the early founders of the IEA feel, well, I mean, this might be a club for people who think that way, but we don't seem to be making any progress, or did your father and other Others in the early days of the IEA know that this would take a sort of generation to get anywhere or were instant results expected? And was there sort of anger or frustration when instant results didn't appear? Or did everybody know this was going to be a long haul? I don't think anybody knew how it was going to work at all. I think if they thought it was going to be 20, 25 years before there were any results, they, 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 nothing would have stopped my dad. He wanted, he believed in freedom. He wanted to 
to, to he had to do this thing um, and, and promote freedom and try to explain to other people how it worked. Um, he was a member of the Montpelier Society and that exists to facilitate an exchange of ideas on the values and workings of a free society. Discussing this uh, amongst each other, looking at the ways it worked, promoting it, that he would have done that, whatever. But I mean, 20, 25 years is a very, very long time. And when I talk with people in think tanks around the world now, they say, oh, I've been doing this for two years and nothing's happened. And I tend to say, well, try for another 22 and something might. But it got much quicker now with, with, um, with modern technology and things. Um, no, the first, I think the first, um, even, I mean, even two lines in a newspaper was a big excitement. And I think the biggest excitement for a long time was when they promoted um, uh, paying for blood. <laughs> and the, the, great, the great day when there's two inches in a, in a newspaper um, about this book, uh, this extraordinary, terrible book that promoted, promoted the idea of paying for blood because you get more of it. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I let me ask you a little more about two other institutions as well. The, um, you're the current chairman of the Mont Pelerin Society. That was founded by Friedrich Hayek to bring together classical liberal thinkers. Tell us a little about that, what that exists for. And, and then I want to ask you a little bit about the Atlas Network, which was also uh, founded by uh, Sir Anthony, of course. But the Mont Pelerin Society was sort of the first beginnings of bringing together classical liberal pro-freedom thinkers to start to work out how to get freedom ideas spread again, am I right? It, it was again my, my hero, Friedrich Hayek. Um, and he believed after the war, literally just at the end of the war, that there were only 30 people who really understood and believed in freedom in the whole world. And he, he raised the money to get them all together um, in a hotel on Mont Pelerin. Um, and this is what they set up to do. I mean, this is a rather, rather um, ungrand way of saying it. It is to facilitate an exchange of ideas on the values and workings of a free society. Um, and it was intended for academics, for them to have private conversations, um, to, to debate all these things. And of course, Hayek was making, writing all these wonderful books. Um, and there were no less, I think, than eight, seven or eight Nobel laureates who were members of the Mont Pelerin Society. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm spectacularly honored to be in that position for two years, because that's how long it lasts. Um, I'm not an academic. I'm absolutely nowhere near the brain power of any of those people. But I do, I do have a passion for making these ideas available to people around the world who who see the misery and repression and the poverty in which they live. They see the success of so many places in the world, and they wonder what it is they have to do to get that to happen in their countries. Imagine what would happen to to all the refugees trying to cross the channel if it was as wonderful in um, <laughs> Syria, well, that's, that's war, but in countries which are just poor, um, if these sort of changes could happen there. So you've mentioned as well that, so it's uh, in, in terms of the kind of key tasks that the IA set about doing and, and, and other think tanks have followed, the idea was to sort of take the scholarly literature to make sure that the arguments and ideas were based in research, not to sort of sloganize uh, and just wave placards around, but to make sure it was in, one was engaged in a battle of ideas, not just a shouting match, to avoid electoral politics, not to endorse candidates or run for election, no. but to kind of engage in a, an educational mission and a discussion to try and just sort of spread these ideas I think Hayek talked about the second-hand dealers in ideas to particularly yes. make an effort to get them to teachers and journalists and filmmakers and academics. Yes, they were non-academics. In Hi, he was an academic, and I think everyone who wasn't but was sort of intellectual, they were the second-hand dealers in ideas. I've decided I'm a second-hand dealer in ideas. I think I fit that rather well. Uh, and so, so it's, it's sort of this mixture between trying to change the world but to do so through... Um, uh, through a research-based process uh, and through discussion and investigation and research rather than taking to the streets and waving banners, but also distinct from being a, a university that might not have a mission to bring about change, is simply yes. trying to, you know, get to whatever uh, the answer is and, you know, just describe the world rather than prescribe things for the world. That's it really was, I think to genuinely, certainly the Montpellier Society, was to genuinely look at how things were um, and... How, what made things tick and what produced the best results. Um, and I mean, of course, um, uh, 
so that that you could you could with conviction promote these solutions and um, it's the sort of underlying ideas that I'm so keen on promoting because most people in the world don't have an access any access to any books on these ideas and I think to myself if I hadn't been brought up with the IEA and my father and things um, if I hadn't, well, we had used to have Hayek to come and stay. Um, mm -hmm. If I hadn't had Radham Smith to read, would I have any idea that actually free societies were, were the best place for people to be? Absolutely not. So, so it's about exposing people to those uh, sort of ideas. I, I guess to talk a little about the battle of ideas, I, I can't remember who it was who said there are no final victories in the battle of ideas. You might you know, opinion might shift in one direction and then back in the other. It's very interesting to look at the history of the IEA, some of the proposals in the early days of the IEA or its first decade or so that were considered unbelievably <laughs> radical at the time. I think one of oh. the, uh, the uh, you know, should we privatise telecoms, for example, was considered yes. to be sort of, what, what madman would ever do that? <laughs> now, probably if you argued to nationalise all telecoms, you'd be considered a bit strange. But is there ever a final victory or is there just a sort of permanent discourse between people who like the idea of freedom, perhaps people who oppose the idea of freedom for whatever means? And is, is it always just a kind of intellectual tug of war or are there some final victories where the world moves on saying, oh, yeah, I've got it now. This is why we need free exchange or uh, why we don't want the government running this particular industry. Oh, I'm sure it's never over. And the people who think differently from me, uh, I think are mostly they believe like I do that what they think is the answer and um, it is <coughs> um, I mean H Hayek and us uh, believe that there should be safety nets of some sort they don't want to see people you know starving in the street of course not um, but the question is is how you get make the best use of the resources so you get the the the, the biggest overall Pie. I don't really like these sort of analogies. Um, um, and, and if when governments run things, they're not so productive, and I think most of us think that is true, then of course you have so much less to help those who need some help with, let alone for the ones who, who are doing well to flourish. I, I mean, there are genuine differences of opinion, and I think it's swinging the other way now. I think the younger generations, uh, you know, Thatcher isn't... isn't um, it isn't, universally, it isn't universally, isn't um, universally approved of. Um, although I think, my goodness, you know, um, rent control, exchange control. I mean, the modern generation has no idea what exchange control is. Well, but perhaps and you could you tell think, to the modern generation working on YouTube what the exchange, what exchange controls uh, were. Indeed, this was this was one of the early policy victories for the IA, yes. right? Oh, it was, it was. was. And I remember the book. I've got years, the book yeah. in my shelf there, um, on, which set out exactly what to do. And although um, Jeffrey Howe never said that that's where he got it from, I mean, he did it so exactly like that. Um, um, and exchange controls, I mean, Hayek said, apart from being shut up yourself, exchange controls are the most vicious con thing that control the government can put on you. Mm -hmm. so. um, I said I'd want to know a little about the Atlas Network as well. This was also founded by Sir Anthony, and you've uh, until very recently been the chairman of the Atlas Network. And the idea here was to kind of replicate IEAs all over the planet, right? So it was a kind of facilitator to try and get other IEAs set up in different territories and jurisdictions. Yes. Well, needless to say, while, while the IEA wasn't having any great results and everyone was grinding away putting out these papers... Um, there weren't too many people who wanted to copy it. But as Thatcher came along and began to put these things into practice, and previously um, the UK was the, the, uh, the sick man of Europe for years, I always used to think, well, what have I done to live in the sick man of Europe? And then Thatcher came along and exchange control went and rent control went and other controls went. Um, and there were tough times. There, there were tough times, high unemployment, and there was some high inflation. But people could see the way things were going. And, and other people who thought, as we do, classical liberals, um, uh, began to come from all over the world and say, how did you do this thing? I can remember at the IEA about five years ago, Hernando de Soto was there, who's uh, had some of the, the most um, exciting insights into property rights and things. And he sat me down and said, Linda, you have to listen to this. I came here when your father was running, was with the IEA. And I said to him, tell me, 
what it is you do. Um, and um, he said, I want, I want to be influential. I want you to tell me how to do it. And dad said, oh, well, I'll come over to, to, to um, Latin America and I want to come anyway. And he sat down at my kitchen table and he told me exactly what he'd done with the IEA. And I did it and I am influential. <laughs> Um, and people were coming from everywhere. But actually, by then, Dad was living in America. He'd married Dorian. And um, there were so many people coming to his door. He started the Atlas, um, now Atlas Network. And um, uh, it was to help uh, people start IEAs. And they had booklets and things how to do it, he and Dorian. Um, and when he died in 1988, there were, I think, 34 clones in America and Europe. Um, and now there's something like 500 in nearly 100 countries. And it, obviously things have changed. Uh, the IT has come along um, and Atlas does a fantastic job. They aren't, they don't have groups in countries, people in countries who think that this is a solution, possible solution for countries, come and find them. And Atlas supports projects that these people want to do. The project, the ideas come from the people, the partners, they are organizations completely independent and Atlas supports them, helps them with training um, and are beginning to get some really, really spectacular, spectacular results. And I mean, that's, um, I'm, I run Network for Free Society, which is a little, little organization. And um, I had a, a, a sort of um, an interesting moment when the internet came along because people began to, um, dad was never able to get things going in, in Asia and Africa, because it just took so long for information to get backwards and forwards. But when the internet began to come in in the early 90s, people began to find us and find um, people, who, IA and, and other people, and, and saying, and they want to do this thing. And so one would help them find small amounts of money. We were in we're Turkey and Ghana in the early years, India, Pakistan. Um, and um, one day I said to our friend in Kenya, what's the, what can I help you with the most? And he said, books. And I was gobsmacked. I said, but you have books in Kenya. He said, I don't have a single book. There is no book in Kenya that tells me about a free society. There is no book that tells me about the rule of law or property rights. I was humbled. I was literally about this big because I, I couldn't understand why they couldn't see what was going on elsewhere. If one so you assumed no you assumed all of these guys had a bookshelf full of pro freedom material, <laughs> like the one behind you right now, well, right? I, I don't know what I thought. I mean, I, I'm I'm embarrassed to think about it now. So my mission since then, and the mission of Network Free Society, is to make the texts that explore and explain the principles and values of free society accessible in countries and languages where they're not at the moment available. Available. There are countries where there wasn't a single text in that language, there still probably are, and where there was nobody who understood or promoted these views, and some of them are pitifully poor. And so I have, um, I've loved it. I've got so many friends in Afghanistan and Pakistan and um, countries where life is really difficult, and they're doing a phenomenal job, um, a phenomenal job. Um, they, first of all, uh, we, we, we used to try sending them books. It was too expensive. Then um, I was sort of thrashing around wondering what we could do. And someone suggested a CD. May seem very old fashioned to some of you, but I can tell you, if you live in Burundi and you have no text at all, you're very happy with a CD. I don't know if I can do this. That is the yep. English CD. It has about a hundred texts on it. And I could send it to Afghanistan. I did, I sent a thousand to Afghanistan and it costs about 70 cents to write it, make it and get it to Afghanistan. And that's a hundred texts. Here's the French one, which was a real revolution because if you live in Francophone Africa, there were no texts. And this has Bastiat, it has translations, IEA translations. It has one of the best books for this purpose, Foundations of a Free Society in French, written by Eamon Butler from next door. This is one in Arabic. And we've just produced, or rather, the um, uh, the Arab centres just produced a new one in French and Arabic. Um, and you could send these all over the world, and people were absolutely so excited to get them. We what's said, what's really interesting here is essentially. So I'm being a bit of an economist about this, but what you're sort of saying is the barriers to entry to set up a think tank have fallen. 
right? So back in the 1950s or 1960s, you needed a lot of philanthropy. You probably needed to secure an office. You need to print all of these books. You're now saying that you can get 100 texts on one of these CDs for a dollar, basically. Yeah. Uh, um, so tell us a little bit more about how Network for a Free Society has, has spread these texts or CDs around the world. Give us a sense of the, the scale of it, uh, how you go about it, how do you get the right text to the right people, how is it distributed, what do they make of it when they receive this material? Well, it started off with us making, I think, 5,000 of the original CD in English, and I was dead nervous. I didn't know whether I'd be able to send them, I didn't know whether people would be interested in them. Anyway, we, we sent off a thousand, it was a thousand, five hundred each, it may have been to, to our new friends in, in, in definitely in Ghana, um, Franklin in Ghana, it was um, India, Pakistan, um, a, and they did use them and they did get there. Mm -hmm. And very soon, very soon, they came back and said, we need some more. And um, Julian Morris, who actually I was working with at the time, said, OK, Linda, well, go and make 100,000 of them. <laughs> I thought, oh, crikey, this isn't really what I, what I, where I thought we were going. So I tried to raise the money for 100,000 and I couldn't. I raised the money for 50,000, but then I became innovative and I got 100,000 texts with them. And I think I've probably so sent 80,000 from our kitchen table. And we used wow. to send them in batches of 2,000, 3,000. I remember sending 8,000 to Adedeo Thomas in Nigeria, and he used them. And we only sent them to people who wanted them, who understood what they were, and they would take them to students. They would distribute them to groups explaining what they were. And so the idea was you explained to big groups what they were, and you gave them to the groups. And then when you found out of a big group, maybe at a conference, there were 20 people who were sure. really interested. You got them into a smaller group and that you would get leaders out of these groups. Um, and that is really what's happened. Um, but then the other thing we discovered was once you've got the text out there on the CD, then it was easier to print them. And right. so now what we do is we fund the CDs than printing the CDs in their own country, because funnily enough, it's got more difficult to get them through customs. Um, um, and then we fund people to print well, IA books, translate IA books. For so could you, I, I know, I know, Linda, you've sent the tech team here a few uh, photographs. Yeah. Perhaps you could no, tell well, us a couple um, of the stories around okay. those. Okay. Um, I mean, if you, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a story really of how Atlas works. And I'm going to have to read some of this so I get the details right. Um, as I said, Atlas Network partners have grown from, I think, one from 34 think tanks to now 90 plus. It's a large and very active network of partners. Um, who are becoming increasingly effective at reducing barriers to opportunity and facilitating escape from poverty. You only have to look at the achievements of the six partners who became the finalists for Atlas' biggest annual prize. This is $100,000 a year achievement prize for the uh, think tank that has really had the greatest achievement. Um, and um, if, uh, if Jack could put up the two Indonesian photos, I'll explain what they are. Um, and and um, this year it went to CHIPS, the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies, um, and um, uh, for their right to eat affordably campaign in Indonesia, which persuaded the Indonesian government that their policy of food self-sufficiency was very detrimental for the poor. They completely banned any food imports for years and it forced up the price of food and caused one in five children to be malnourished. Um, um, chips, and this is the IEA book, um, Free Trade and How It Enriches Us, uh, produced a year ago, two years ago, a year ago. And so we gave Chips the money, they translated it, and that's the book. And the other picture is um, at a press conference where the speakers are, have taken the books. Mm -hmm. And this book, was sort of, I mean, it, obviously it wasn't the thing that influenced everything, but it was the book, the IEA book they used to promote this campaign. And the government, um, the government realized that um, having a policy of food self-sufficiency was causing so much damage um, to, to their people who were starving. Um, and um, they reduced the import restrictions, which have resulted in food cost savings of 1.9 billion over the last three years quite some result for one young think tank. 
and the books that supported their campaign was the IEA's Free Trade and How It Enriches Us, whose translation and public publication was funded by Network for a Free Society. So sort of thing, it's good, isn't it? <laughs> um, but I, I guess the other thing that people watching might be thinking is, so uh, this is great because this is a project that sort of come to fruition and here's CHIP, so, you know, a, a, an institute that's, that has now established itself. But where do you even begin? When you start with the, you know, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we shared texts about freedom in Ghana or Burundi or Afghanistan? Who gets in touch with who? I mean, how do you even, how, how do you know where to post these things to? From I get you've got a kitchen table and a whole bunch of CDs, <laughs> but how, how do you know what to write on the envelope? I tell you, Mark, I'll do a deal. If you let me tell you about Burundi and Afghanistan yeah, and what your books are doing there, I'll tell you how to do that. Great. Um, so um, this would be, Jack, if you could put up the Burundi quiz, quiz one. I mean, this is just such a great story, I think. I mean, just wonderful. Um, the French version of the CD was the first access Aimable Manera Kaiser had to text that covered the concept of a free society. In 2015, he was a student activist desperate for a better life in Burundi. He traveled, for, uh, and for you probably need to know, Burundi is one of the poorest countries in the world. It is 186 out of 190 in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index. The Center for... De um, um, and so there was this chap thinking there has to be a solution. Other people have got a solution. What is the solution? Anyway, someone called Linda Kavuka heard about him and she works for um, Students for Liberty and she was having a seminar in Kenya and she um, got an invitation, I think, um, obviously to, to AMARB and he traveled for four days to get to a Student for Liberty event in Kenya, which was to change his life. He returned to Burundi with copies of the CD and a few books and he started eight chapters of Student for Liberty in Burundi that year and 10 in Rwanda and Congo the following year. He is, he's a superstar. The CD was the only resource they had cheap enough to supply the relevant text in large numbers. And NFS has supplied thousands, I think 8,000 of them over the intervening years. Now on that text is the most wonderful book the IEA produced called Foundations of a Free Society. And I think there are 24, 24 translations now. And, and um, um, Eamon Butler actually wrote it. The IEA published it. And it, it was just to set out, I thought to myself, what would I give to a young person in Africa who said, Linda, what is a free society? Tell me how to do this thing. And well, there wasn't one. I asked all my friends and, um, and somebody said, what about the Constitution of Liberty? And I said, no, I didn't really think the Constitution of Liberty was what we wanted. And that book... Well, that rather goes back to your point that the idea is to get the scholarship in a form that the intelligent layman can understand, right? Yes, yeah, and uh, absolutely. Anyway, that book we'd had translated into French and we'd had it put on the CD in French, especially for Francophone Africa. Um, and these guys had nothing. Uh, um, Amarb had never heard of these ideas before. So anyway, um, we've also, over the years, we funded um, translations, seminars, conference, and their flagship annual international quiz competition, which involves 12,000 students every year. This photo, there are 103 students taking part of one of 18 legs of the, oh, it's gone again. Um, do you think we could have it back just for a second, Jack? Um, uh, they're holding the CDs in French, which contain the most um, translated IEA book, uh, as I've said, Foundations of a Free Society. A. Marb himself has read the book. You can see, can you see all of the CDs? Um, I've mm -hmm. got one here and there they all are there. Um, they all get given one. Oh, I don't know if they all get given one. I think their team maybe has to win to get one. I mean, they are so scarce there that, that, that um, it's the only possession they have and the only text they have. Amar read the book from cover to cover and he attributes his understanding of the principles and foundations of a free society to it, um, also his ability to promote and defend them. He then founded the Center for Development and Enterprise all in the last five years, which is now succeeding in changing the environment for enterprise in Burundi. They have managed to get the government to cut the cost of registering a business from 78 to $22 and reduce other restrictions as well, with the result that 23% more jobs were created in 2018 than 2017, and new business registrations increased by 49.8% in that year. So that's what, if you're an IEA supporter, a donor, 
that's what you are doing. If, mm -hmm. if you, you really are doing a wonderful job um, and giving these people access to these ideas. And I think you wanted to mention Afghanistan. I do. Well. I have to tell you my Afghan story. Are they going to want to shut me up in a minute? Uh, I, mean, I think it would be. I mean, the, the Burundi. I mean, the, the, I think many people would just be amazed that any ideas of freedom are, 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 are getting to these places, but also that it's basically come from your kitchen table, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, well, it was other places. I mean, it came through, you know, there were, there were sort of lots of people involved. Now, that's the Burundi one. Sorry, I've shuffled my bits of paper. I need to get the facts right about... Um, there's Burundi on page four. Sorry about this, but I need to get this right, and I'm getting old, and I get confused. Um, five, six must be here. There we go. Um, so... Um, we have supported, oh, now this one, look at this. This is Afghanistan. Um, we have supported the Afghan Economic, um, A Economic and Legal Studies Organization for probably 10 years, um, including paying for translations and publications, which they've distri distributed through their academy and radio station. I mean, when they started, there were sort of two of them and very little funding, um, and they are, absolutely fantastic. There's a young man at the bottom of the left-hand side of the table, Khalid Ramsey. His brother, I met his brother, and um, after the organization got going, Khalid um, has been running it. He's a, he's a young lawyer. Um, now here, uh, oh, um, could I have the other Afghan one first, please? Because that's the way my, my, my text is going. Um, they've distributed through their academy and radio station, um, dozens of the CDs, and books. And here is an event we supported in August with 400 young people at a conference in Kabul on tolerance, freedom and peace, where they will have or they will get copies of the book. Now, they get phenomenal audiences. This is all in the open. The government is happy about it, promoting um, freedom in, in Afghanistan. Um, and they believe, as so many people I work with, I work with some absolutely, I really enjoy the Muslims I work with, and they believe that Islam, uh, is, there is a, Islam is compatible with a free society under certain interpretations. So um, I'm very, very, get very excited about the work I do with them. Um, one of the books that they translated into Dari is Islamic Foundations of a Free Society, an IEA book. And if you put up the other photograph, please, and here it is as the subject for discussion in their series. Oh no, that's Borno State in, that's Boko Haram. The um, other Afghan one that you had up before, please. Um, there we go. Here is an event we supported in August with 400 young people at a conference in Kabul on the tolerance, um, freedom and peace where they will get copies of the book. This, you can see the blue book they've all got in front of them. That is an IEA book translated into Dari, and which dozens and dozens of Afghans now um, are reading. Uh, not written, obviously, it's not written by me, not written by an English person. It's you you facilitated it. the translation and the distribution, basically. It's got, it's got um, eight essays by Muslims from well, Turkey, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, Muslim scholars, um, really interesting, interesting um, essays. And it has now been translated into Dari and Urdu. Um, and um, we held a marvelous um, um, seminar in, uh, in, in Iran, in Quob, which is the religious capital of Iran. And they were perfectly open and there were pictures of Ayatollahs all over the place. And we haven't got a picture of the one in, in Iran. I um, didn't get it out. Um, and they had a discussion in Iran using um, the Islamic Foundations of a Free Society book as the basis for it. Um, and uh, I mean, it was all perfectly open, um, so extraordinary. And then the other photograph, um, oh, I have to tell you what, the, that, that the, the Afghan Economic and Legal Studies Organization team are now working with legislative departments, such as the National Assembly of Afghanistan and the Ministry of Justice to make their laws free from discrimination with respect to individual freedom and to encourage legislative departments to with review those laws which were adopted during communist and Taliban regime and have their radical points removed. Now, um, really, I mean, they, they have had books from other places and obviously they've had support, a lot of support from other places, but 
um, the books and the CDs that 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 we have enabled um, them to have with the IA books on have found formed the basis of all of this. Sure. So um, we sure. are. I think it is effective. I think the IA books are effective, and I'm just really excited that I'm part of a part of able a little cog to get those make those ideas available to other people. Well, quite a big cog, like but, what... but I want them to have the choice of reading them. So quite a big cog, really. And what I'm what I'm interested in, <laughs> so, uh, and you've explained how this network uh, has 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 changed. Uh, we'll also make sure all of the photos are attached in the in the show notes below. I mean, you you must be optimistic about how technology is making the spread of these ideas more readily available, right? I mean that. I mean, just your you know, the CD with 100 texts on them for a dollar or whatever it is compared to having to print books. I've had stories about, you know, the difficulties of smuggling in pro-freedom books to the Soviet Union or Cuba or or, or, or wherever, wherever else, uh, notwithstanding the regulations that might make getting CDs through customs a little bit harder. It, it seems, doesn't it, that technology is facilitating the spread of ideas. And if we're confident our ideas are the right ones, the best ones will rise to the top. I mean, we, sh we should be looking to the Atlas Network having 5,000 groups, not 500. In <laughs> Don't worry, time, Atlas right? Network is trying. And they're yeah. doing an absolutely one, one, wonderful job. Yes. Um, and one thing one should say at this stage, one should thank all of the people who do support this, people who put money into this, people who believe that who also want to give freedom, the present of freedom to people who don't have it. Um, and um, if there was more funding available, we could obviously help more groups get going and, and get more of this to happen. But um, and, and and at nickel and dime prices. Well, well, I'll, I'll oh, make yes, sure. No, no, yeah, absolutely. A, thou, a dollar, a dollar for a CD. We can get you a dollar for a, a CD. We can get a dollar a CD to any of these these countries. And then it's right. So if my maps are right for ten thousand dollars, we can get ten thousand CDs. <laughs> right, um, Linda. Linda, let me come to some of the questions. I've been taking up nearly all of your time, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to take some of the questions which might jump around a little from the chat. Uh, Miko Rivero asks, "Thank you for giving us the historical perspective and the motivation behind the founding of IEA. How do you see the IEA's development and its direction in future?" Well, the trouble with being old is is you tend to see things as you see them. And I don't think one's as innovative. And I'm sure somebody could come along with ways of, of, of promoting freedom more effectively. And actually, I think the eye is about to do it. You're about to do an online course. Um, and I think I mean, you get thousands of people signing up to online courses and people could sign up for the IA's online course from all over the world. Um, so there are lots and lots of going to be lots of other ways of doing it but I think it's very difficult to get away from people have to understand the basic concept of why freedom is so productive about the creative power of freedom um, um, and they have to to understand how that works so they can obviously um, um, increase it improve the environment for enterprise in their countries um, well, I've got a why, why the books and the education side of this is so, so important to the freedom movement. And that's, uh, I mean, when you've read loads of books about it and you're kind of committed to the, the cause of, uh, of human liberty and free markets and free enterprise, it might seem uh, kind of natural to you. I now just automatically think in a free market direction. But actually quite a lot of these ideas are counterintuitive, right? That trade benefits both parties. Oh. I mean, intuitively, you think zero-sum game. So mm. there, there does seem to be a kind of educational element because yeah. so many of ideas, whilst I think are right, are counterintuitive, that that process of books and learning and education seems so important. Well, and it's so natural. You want to help people. And so you want to give them things. But then the next thing you want to do is take money off other people to give them things, um, i.e. the government. And then it's very easy to ignore the effect mm -hmm. of, on the people you've taken the money away from. Then you have unintended consequences. Um, it isn't, it is, it is, uh, intu it is not intuitive if that's what yeah. i'm trying to say and it needs explaining some people have it in their dna they really really do they just get it other people have to learn it and um and i understand why why people think that other systems are better but if you look at the results if you look at uh, the fraser index if you look at the world bank ease of doing business the countries which are freer 
like Hong Kong or was are better for human flourishing are so much better life expectancy in Hong Kong is 20 years more than in Tanzania yeah. and you know the, the the sort of restrictions are not that blindingly obvious but it has to be what the difference is yep um, Christopher Marshall's got a, a question. This is interesting. This goes back to the uh, Hayek's advice to your father to avoid politics. Uh, don't go into electoral politics. Go and go and you know prosecute the battle of ideas. Uh, but of course, think tanks interact with public policy. Christopher Marshall says, Linda, you mentioned twenty five years to achieve some influence. Was Mrs. Thatcher the first politician to seriously listen to the IEA? No, Ted Heath was, surprisingly. When he was People are going to find that very yeah, hard to believe. Well, I'll tell you what happened. He was you president of the Board of Trade, I think. I need my husband here because he's so good on these details. When I'm not he's not here, I look rather stupid because this I was don't... on price fixing, wasn't it? Yeah. It was um, resale price maintenance, yeah. Yeah. which most people have forgotten about. And at that point in time, um, if you were a manufacturer, you could say, My Mars bar will sell for six pence wherever it is on the high street. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, competition is so important in, in, in getting the best value for resources. And um, the I, Basil Yemi wrote a book. Um, it was all, you see, Basil Yemi wrote a book explaining why resale price maintenance was very bad for poor people. Well, somebody gave it to Ted Heath, or he came to the IEA, and he said, okay, I'm gonna make my name. I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> and he did it. Um, and he was very soon accosted by, by all and sundry who said, you've ruined my life. I used to be able to walk the whole way up the high street and know that a Mars bar would be 6p. Well, now he said, it's all sorts of prices. Yeah. But of course, no supermarkets with, with resale price maintenance. And, and it was so unlikely that Ted Heath would do it, but it was so well packaged. And it was like actually the second book that the IA produced to let. Um, everyone, there, were, there, was, there was rent control everywhere, houses were falling down, and this, the state of the, the housing market was terrible. Um, and the first, I can't remember what the first book was, um, and one, I, I was looking the other day for it, you know, I haven't got it on my bookshelf anymore. Anyway, a well-known economist, I think from the Financial Times, wrote about it, something about this extraordinary thing that the IEA had written, this book. He said, I can't think he'll write the second. And then <laughs> this was in the foreword to the second book. And he mm. said, and there you are, I've done it. Right. And it was on to let. And it's still... Which was against rent controls. We, we, had the, we had the government telling landlords exactly yes. what they could charge. So again, you can see intuitively how that might appeal to people, right? To make sure tenants aren't... But the, the problem is that the housing stock just starts to fall into a dilapidated state, right? Yeah, and that book, that was the first one that went travelling, because soon after that, my dad went out and helped the Fraser Institute get going in in in, Calif in Canada, where they had rent control. So he took the book with him, and they made their own version of it. So it's these, it's these explaining these truths that are not intuitive. Yeah. And um, so people can understand how it is they work and how poor people benefit most from them. That's what I'm interested in. I want poor people to have the choices I've had. That's really interesting. Some, somebody asked, I can see, Linda, I can see you have a plethora of books behind you, most notably the IEA books just behind you. As someone who loves books the IEA produces, I must ask, can you name your three favourite IEA books of all time? That's quite a, that's quite a challenging one. Well, uh, um, what foundations would you point people of, towards? Foundations of a Free Society, um, is, is just a fantastic... By Eamon Butler, who... Yes, it's... it's um, well, he was such a star because I said, we need that book, and would he do it? Um, and the IA published it. I had to raise some money for it, which good friends um, Alan Gibbs produced, um, and the book jumped the queue, and there it was. And it, it you see people, their eyes light up. They understand it. And the brilliant thing about it is it's in chapters. So if you're in a country like Armenia, where there's not a single person, maybe two now, who understand these ideas and you have students who want to learn about them, they can study it chapter by chapter, just yep. really, really clear. The other book I absolutely love, and we've just um, helped um, uh, it be translated into Hindi, is public choice, which is such a stupid term. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, it's effectively um, the opposite of public choice. Yeah, it's absolutely. bureaucrat choice. But yes. when you read it, it's just wonderful. And actually, we 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 had it translated into um, into Farsi um, for uh, Iran quite a few years ago now. And these books um, they have to be approved 
to do it. And they do approve it. I mean, we've had Foundation of Free Society translated into Farsi and they've approved it. Um, and, and the chap <laughs> wrote back to, to the, to the um, editor, to the um, translator and said, how do you know how things work in Iran? <laughs> right. <laughs> because everything happened in the book happened in Iran. It's, it's government right. all over the place. So I love that book. Oh, I don't know which way I third So one. it's the ones with universal applicability that really That's appeal me. to you. Yep. Yes. I mean, of course, the Tulek ones are absolutely wonderful. Um, and, and the exchange control one, and think how much good it's done in the world. But I just love these ones that, that explain things. Eamon Butler is an absolute mm. star at writing them. And he... And, and just to say in the in the Zoom chat and in the YouTube chat, we put a, 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 a link to the uh, Foundations of Free Society. PDFs are available in more than a dozen dozen languages if you uh, click on on that link. Uh, yeah, I link I have some more. I must get them and put them up there. Yeah, no, exactly. We, we will put them in as many languages as you can find on your kitchen table, Linda. Um, <laughs> The, uh, let me finish up with a couple of questions. Linda, you work in so many different countries across the world. Where have you seen the fastest growth in free market ideas? Which countries are you the most optimistic about? Oh, well, I mean, I've seen some amazing changes. If you think what happened to the UK and if you think what happened to New Zealand, I mean, New Zealand was New Zealand was an absolute basket case. And now it's right at the top of everything. Mm -hmm. And it did all these changes. And I, it's, I, want, I mean, it makes me feel ooh, terribly old. I know all the people who did it. And these people, they were principled. They believed in the sort of things we believe in. Um, and they had that window of opportunity to make these changes. Um, and, and watching from country turning from a basket case into one of the most admired countries in the world makes me think even more strongly these ideas are the ones that lift people from poverty. Um, makes and me more excited and want to go out and get some more, raise some more money to translate. Well, that, that leads very neatly into my um, final question to you. This question is, if you receive £2,000 tomorrow, I don't know why I picked 2000 but nice round sum. Um, uh, this is an anonymous question, but I'm sure this person is intending to send you £2,000. Let's hope so, and I'll just follow in, in, in this person's footsteps. Where is it most needed right now? That's to say, how would you spend it? Oh, I know exactly how I'd spend it because um, there, there's a, 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 a liberty group, a young new liberty group in Nigeria. And when they heard what we were doing in Ghana with, um, we've, we've too long a story, it's another story. Anyway, um, 2000 children are going to um, um, have a new course in entrepreneurship and um, economics. In, in Ghana, in, in Uganda. Um, and my young friend in Nigeria heard about it and he said, couldn't he have some books too? And I'd run out of my budget for this year, so no books for him. So I would be on the blower to him immediately saying, we can get you a thousand books for your schools. Fantastic. So, the, and, and it's just the cost of production has just come down so much. So we've, yeah. we've put a link in the Zoom chat and in the YouTube chat to uh, Network for a Free Society. Please click on that link. Uh, if you've got £2,000 to spare, I know Linda can uh, spend it very well as she's just uh, articulated. You've got a bit less of, than that to spare. All money uh, very, very gratefully received. Uh, Linda, we've overrun our time pretty much, but thank you so much for uh, joining us and explaining what think tanks do, why they're here, and these inspirational stories about how ideas of freedom are, are spreading in parts of the world, often based on the research that the IA and other think tanks are conducting or have conducted over many decades here. It's fascinating to hear, and I encourage uh, all of you on uh, both platforms, the Zoom and the YouTube platform, to check out Network for a Free Society, and if you can help in any way um, uh, at all, please do so. Uh, thanks especially to our IEA donors whose generous support uh, we rely on entirely to spread these ideas. And I, uh, Linda's given you a great overview of how your money Im can impact way, way beyond these shores uh, when some of these books and material are spread into parts of the world that you wouldn't even imagine that we get there. And again, remember how, how cheaply uh, we can now circulate those ideas. So any donation you make can now go further and faster than it could previously have done um, some uh, years ago. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, hosting you. Thank you for all of the work that you have done 
over many, many years for the IA and the wider global freedom movement. Um, it's absolutely inspiring to hear about it. It's been a real pleasure having you join us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, got to finish on a on a few advertisements. We're approaching Christmas, but the IEA calendar remains pretty full. You can join me on the IEA London YouTube channel tomorrow at six o'clock for our weekly Live with Littlewood, where we'll be bringing free market analysis to the week's events. On Thursday at 1 p.m. on our YouTube stream, we will be launching our book, After Brexit, What Next? Trade Regulation and Economic Growth, written by Patrick Minford and David Minar. We'll be joined by Patrick Minford, Steve Davies, and the event will be chaired by our academic and research director, Saeed Kamal. And um, going into next week, we'll be rounding up a year of, of virtual events. We'll be running some virtual events next year, but it's hopefully some live ones as well, with the Hayek Lecture uh, delivered by our head of education, Dr. Steve Davis. That's on, the, on December the 17th. Keep an eye out on social media and the, new, the IEA newsletter for more details of that event uh, uh, and join us there for, for that one. If you're not yet uh, in receipt of our newsletter, just go to iea.org.uk plug in your email address and you'll get our, our, our weekly bulletin. Linda, thanks again. Been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thanks for all who've watched us on Zoom and on YouTube. See you again very soon. Over and out.